Hi everyone, my name's Nidhi. Um, I'm part of the Students of Dentistry team and we've been hosting these virtual events for a few weeks now. We're trying to alternate between um, events for dental students one week and then pre-dents the next week. So some of our past events have been like a DAT question and answer session. And then we also had um, people in their residencies come in and talk about that for dental students. So right here's our team. And this week, our event is um, a question and answer session for the application that's out for people applying the cycle. So we have three lovely panelists here. So to start off, if you guys want to introduce yourselves and just talk a little bit about the application, that'd be great. Hey guys, my name is Brandon. Uh, I'm a senior at Cornell University who just went through the application process uh, in applying to dental school. Um, I'll ultimately be attending Stony Brook University on Long Island um, for the next four years. And I'm really excited to do that. Um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about the application process. So I took my DAT um, at, during my, my winter break of junior year in college, uh, and then I applied um, my senior fall. Um, and so ultimately went through my, I applied during the summer and then went through my senior fall where, when I was doing interviews. Um, and that's a little bit about the time that my timeline. Uh, I can go next. Um, I'm Michelle. Um, I'm a fourth year right now at UCLA. I actually just graduated. We were like on the quarter system. So I finished in the winter. Um, I'm going to be attending the University of Michigan next year. Um, go blue. Okay. And I um, had a similar timeline to Brandon where I, um, the only difference that I took my DAT between um, my sophomore year and my junior year um, over the summer. And I also applied um, right before my senior year and was interviewing at the beginning of my senior year. Hey everyone, my name is Austin Verghese. Uh, I'm a senior, well, I'm graduating from Rutgers University actually today, um, this, uh, this evening. Uh, I applied right when cycle opened up. I took my DATs right when COVID actually started. So right when classes transitioned online, I'll be, I was home as well studying the whole time. And I took my DATs maybe uh, June, uh, middle June, and I applied within that week as well. Uh, and then I started interviewing uh, in September. Awesome, so it's great. Uh, so great to meet all you guys. So we'll start uh, with our panel questions now. Uh, so firstly, we note that the application um, lets you highlight six experiences on the form. What do you recommend um, are the best experiences to help you stand out the best? Yeah, so I'll kind of start off here first. Um, so um, in kind of my application process and my interview process, while I did a lot of different sorts of events, whether they be volunteering or academic based, um, I kind of definitely stuck to emphasizing three main areas. So, uh, and, and three kind of main things that I did during my undergrad. Uh, so firstly was I was involved heavily in research and I began, began that in my sophomore year. Uh, I was lucky enough to be involved with taste bud research within the, the Department of Food Science. Um, so while it wasn't dental related exactly, it did have its, you know, kind of relations to the oral cavity more generally. So it was really something that uh, dental schools really like. So your research doesn't necessarily have to be anything related to dentistry, for example. Um, but that is one thing I would definitely emphasize there. Um, the next thing, if you, whatever leadership positions you're involved with would be really important to, to highlight, of course. Um, so I was on the orientation uh, committee where I more or less was working with a group of nine, nine other students where we were facilitating um, orientation events for the 4,000 incoming students each year at Cornell, um, Cornell University. And then finally, um, I also began my own club at school. So I talked about that a lot um, in a lot of my, my essays and things like that. So basically anything where you're uh, holding a leadership position, research if it's applicable. Um, but of course you could really highlight anything if it's something that you like to do. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Brandon just said. I think um, I was involved in like a lot of different things, um, but I made sure to highlight the things that like I was most passionate about um, just because whoever's interviewing you, if it's um, an open interview, those are definitely going to be the things that they ask you about. So you like don't want to highlight something that you can't really speak to um, and show your passion for because then it just like doesn't make for a good interview. Um, so I would just say anything that you're like really passionate about, um, make sure to highlight on your application and like, don't be worried if it's like 
kind of all over the place because that's what mine was like because I'm just involved in a lot of different things um but also like leadership positions um everything what Brandy was just saying and likewise I agree with uh what both of them said uh, it's very important that you have experiences and a variety of experiences within not just dental experiences you want to have other outside extracurriculars as well um, I'll talk about a small con I had in my application that all interviews uh, interviewers asked me. Um, so I mainly worked at a pediatric dental office and not a general dental office. And they asked me why I was focusing on pediatric dental office only. They were questioning whether if it was just, it was I just interested in pediatric dentistry, but it was for other reasons that I had to stick with just one office. So it's very important that you have a variety of different offices uh, or just general at least. Um, and then they want to know that you're open to specializing anywhere. You're not focused on just one career yet because they really want to you know, persuade you, influence you, and like show you all these new specialties while you're in dental school. So it's really good to keep an open mind while you go in and have these experiences beforehand as well. Cool. Well, first of all, Michelle, I'm from Ohio, so go Bucks. But, um, and the next thing we were wondering about is who were some of the best people you found to ask for letters of recommendation? And I know it's especially been difficult. You guys went through the COVID experience a bit too, but if you have any advice on that as well. Yeah, with COVID, it was definitely tough. Um, and it was something that I was lucky that I thought about these things really um, well ahead of time. And it could, I could see a situation where if you're entirely on a Zoom class, for example, um, during these past few semesters where you're looking to get a letter of recommendation for, for example, a biochem or a physics professor, um, it could be difficult to do uh, on the, in the Zoom environment. Um, but to answer your question, um, I got my three letters of recommendation, one from my principal investigator of the lab that I mentioned earlier, uh, secondly, from an oral surgeon who I was very close with, um, and then thirdly, from my biochemistry professor. So I kind of took the approach of getting, you know, three major, uh, two academic kind of related positions, and then thirdly, someone who could speak to uh, kind of how I am in a dental office, for example. And I would recommend that for a lot of people. I think if you have letters of recommendation from just, you know, three professors, let's say your, your organic chemistry, your gen chem, and then your bio, for example, um, that, you know, they could see that you're a good student based on your, your transcripts, for example. So I think it would be great if you could kind of diversify um, where you're getting your letters of recommendation from. Yeah, I think letters of rec were definitely like a tricky thing just because you yourself don't have like the control over it. Like you're like constantly relying on someone else for it, um, which for me was kind of difficult. Also like just going to a large school um, like UCLA, for example, like Cornell is also very large. Um, it's just difficult to like make that personal connection in general. So if there's a way for you to kind of like make that connection with like a TA, that was like something that I tended to work on um, and then the TA can kind of like refer all of that information to the professor. That was like kind of how I approached it. I like made sure that I went to my TA's office hours and just like really was on top of that person um, because they're the ones that like can really vouch for like how you act in like a classroom setting. Um, also someone just like threw in the chat if you used Interfolio, I was just about to bring that up. I used Interfolio and I would recommend using it only because you can have them send in the letters before um, like the portal opens. So I guess like doesn't really apply for this cycle because it has already opened. Um, but if anyone's like planning to apply, I guess next cycle, um, I thought it was really helpful to just like have my letters beforehand. So I didn't have to like worry about like a last minute um, like letter being sent in and then my application like not going through. Like there was just, a lot of like stress related to getting the letters of rec. Um, so I think Interfolio kind of like relieved a bit of that stress because you can get the letter beforehand and then really just like feed that letter from Interfolio to AdSAS, like pretty seamlessly actually. So. Yeah, following up what they're saying, uh, you know, your GPA and DT all matter, but I think recommendation letters are a huge thing as well. Um, almost every single one of my interviews, um, they read out specific lines from my recommendation letters and they're like I love this line specifically and I was surprised that they even did that and so it's very important that you know the person who's writing a recommendation letter is someone that knows you personally uh, it's not just a professor that writes out a lot of recommendation letters and it's very nice it's someone that you want to get to know and you don't need to get to know them for years and years you know like some of the professors I had I had one for organic chemistry I only knew for a semester but 
the main relationship we had was that I just asked a lot of questions at the end of class and that's the only way we knew each other. So he incorporated that within my letter, that's what he told me. Um, so it's very important that you try to pick someone that you, um, you know, are close with that can write you something that's more personal than just, you know, he got an A in your class or he got a B plus or something more personal. So I think it's very important. And I'll actually, I'll just have another thing to add in here as well. Um, so my school had utilized the committee letter. So I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with that, but more or less, um, if it's, a lot of schools have it where you just submit three letters of recommendation um, on their own, for example, and they, they're standalone letters and they're sent, sent to, uh, to the dental schools. But what my school did is they took three letters of recommendation and then they interviewed me as well. So these were people who worked at Cornell in the pre-health department, and they ultimately formulated a, a letter of evaluation that would kind of evaluate my candidacy um, from what people had to say about me, and then all the way to, of course, just my academic marks, for example. Um, so one way I kind of, I knew that this, this letter system isn't something that it could lose its, its sense of, you know, how personal it is, um, because ultimately you're having someone write a letter about you um, that is just using all the other letters as, as their source. So I was really clear to the people who wrote my letters of recommendation. I was like, for example, in speaking to my PI, um, of course I wasn't telling him what to write because that was up to him, but I did kind of prompt him with certain things. Like if you could speak to you know X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and that I think was probably helpful in guiding the letter. Um, if you're asking a professor at your university, they do this a lot of the time. Um, they're actually kind of obligated to do these things for you. So don't ever feel like you're, you're being too much or a nuisance by asking your professor for a letter of recommendation. This is something they do all the time. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, and that's just something I want to add in there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so our next question is, uh, what are some good examples of male dexterity to have on the application? So um, I'll talk about two things that I mentioned in, in my application. So um, I have, I guess I'll speak more generally and then I'll, I'll talk about what I had on my application specifically. Um, so they love anything, their, their classic example is playing a musical instrument. Um, and they always talk about that as if you play the piano or violin or something like that, that would be great to mention. But it's really anything, if it's art, if it's sculpting, it's, it's really anything that that involves, you know, a, a level of manual dexterity that could be potentially, you know, uh, translate well in the dental field. Um, so for my application, um, this is kind of like an, a weird fun fact about myself, but um, I had began performing magic when I was five years old. Uh, actually, it was inspired by my dentist when I was younger. Uh, he did magic for me when I was when I was five, and that kind of inspired me to learn the art of magic. Uh, and that transitioned to my to starting my own performance company when I was 11 years old. So I work like you know birthday parties, block parties, bar mitzvahs, and communions and weddings, and so all these different things. So dental schools love the fact that I you know magic of course is sleight of hand. That's the entirety of the of the art, for example. So um, they really love when I talked about that. Uh, and then the next thing is. Uh, in research, I was kind of cryosectioning uh, tissues of, of taste buds and tongues and things like that uh, of, of mice. So the idea of handling like delicate tissue in lab is something that they also enjoyed uh, when, I, when I kind of spoke to. I love that. I like love the magic thing. Um, so like kind of, I guess like similar to that, um, I like did a lot of art um, growing up. Like I was just like very interested in that. Um, I like took AP art and that was like when I started my portfolio. Um, then I decided to like create a website for, website for myself. And I actually put the link to that website in the like manual dexterity, like text box. Um, and someone like brought it up in my interview that they were, it was the first person that they saw ever to like put a website on their application. And they just said it was like very unique. Um, and again, it's just like another way for them to learn who you are as a person. Um, and it also just like shows them anything that you've been working on. Um, so I like have been like telling people to kind of do that. And if, if there's like anything on the web <laughs> that like can vouch for like something on your application. And if there's room in like your text um, count to add that link, then I would definitely do it because like it really like helped me to stand out, I guess, in this one interview. Um, I also just think, like there's a lot of manual dexterity things that people like tend to overlook. I think doing research is a really good example of something that people might overlook um, because a lot of us that are science majors have worked with like 
fine pipettes or like things like that, that do kind of show that you have um, manual dexterity skills, even if you're not interested in like sculpting or painting, um, if you don't play a musical instrument, like definitely don't leave that text box like empty, like try to think outside of the box, try to like think of something that can show that you like work well with your hands. Um, but I do think it's like a pretty important part of the application and I would I would not like overlook it because clearly they, they, they look at that part of the application because that's where I put that link and, and my entire interview is about like my website and my portfolio and everything like that, so. Yeah, I think manual dexterity is definitely such an important part of the application. Um, and you only get a little bit of room to actually write about it. So you really have to emphasize the good parts of your, you know, all your experiences. Luckily for me, I've been playing like four or five different instruments throughout my life. Like I've been in like church bands and stuff like throughout. So I, but I said, I played guitar, piano, and then bass guitar, the main three. But I also wanted to, you know, uh, go outside of just, you know, instruments and talk about other things as well. So my, <clears throat> my dental, uh, my dental club at Rutgers, they do like events like soap carving events and like specific manual dexterity events, which is, I think, such a great thing to put on your application. So I put that. Um, and then little hobbies you have of your own is also important. Like my friends got me a sewing, um, a suturing kit with like dental gums. And it's so, it's so like small and such, um, it's not that much, but I still included in my, uh, my application and even came up during an interview, a very conversation interview, like, oh, what were the dental gums about? Like, what was that I saw? I'm like, I explained it. Like, little things they do read, but it matters as well. Like, they're really focused on, like, what you have been doing and stuff. But, you know, another thing is some D1, D2 students talking about, like, manual dexterity is if you're ever worried about, you know, manual dexterity isn't as good as you think, but, like, that's fine. Every single D1 almost goes in worried about that, they said. And during your D1, D2 years, you'll really like enhance those skills and work on it a lot. So it's something that you want to emphasize that you have been working on, but they know that it's something that you only perfect once you're in dental school. Cool. Before we move on, I think we had a question in the chat asking about Interfolio and how it works. Michelle, I think you said you used it. Austin or Brenda, if you guys used it, feel free to answer. But Michelle, if you could talk about that process and how you do it exactly, that'd be great. Yeah, um, so you actually have to make an account um, and you do unfortunately need to like pay a fee for that. Um, but basically what you'll do is in your account, you will create like, um, you'll like open up a new letter basically. And in that like section, you can add everything that um, either Brandon or Austin was talking about where you can add like things that you would want them to talk about. Um, which is really nice because once they like get the invitation from Interfolio through email, it'll have all of like what you've just written out, um, like right there in their face. So like I used um, that section to include like that they needed to have like a letterhead, they needed to have a signature, um, all those things that like is very important for a letter. Um, and another really great thing about Interfolio is they actually do like a quality check of the letter before you can even send it to AdSAS. So let's say they forget to like do a signature. Um, it'll say on Interfolio that like they have not done that. Um, and then you would go back to your professor and be like, hey, I'm really sorry, but um, like you need to fix this. Um, so once you've received the letter from Interfolio, you'll get like an email just saying like, X professor has just submitted, like, yay. Then a quality check will happen. Um, and that usually takes like a, a week or so. They're pretty good. Um, and then from there, there's actually like a link um, that you like can copy. And that's what you put in AdSAS. Um, so it just like carries the letter basically from Interfolio to AdSAS. Um, and all the letters on Interfolio, you have like the option of like checking a box basically that says that like you have waived um, like any access to the letter. And that's what makes it like a valid um, letter of recommendation because you have not, like, you have not seen it, like, you have not touched it, um, and I hope that answered. If there's anything, like, specific that I just missed, um, let me know, and I can try to touch on it. I think that was really helpful, um, so I guess the next thing I'll ask about, I'm, I'm applying this cycle, um, and I've been very focused on my personal statements, but for these supplemental essays, um, so for me, I'm getting my personal statement proofread and you know a lot of input from a lot of people. 
did you guys have as deep of a process for that for your supplemental essays or I'm assuming you got some people to proofread it. How is that um, for you guys? And how about we start with Austin this time just so you can get it, get your input in first. Yeah, sure. Um, supplemental essays, I think personally is as equally important as your personal statement. You know, it is a personal statement is like, you know, a general view of what, why you want to do dentistry and what your passion is to all the schools. But now one specific school wants to know a little bit more. And it's very important that you apply the same amount of effort you did into your personal statement into your supplemental essays as well. So I had a lot of people proofread it. I had a um, an editor come read it and go over it too and like really like do the same amount of effort they did on my personal statement with my supplemental essays and really direct it toward the question they're specifically asking. You know, sometimes it is the same question you kind of answered in your personal statement, but it's still important that you answer it in a unique way toward that school. Um, my personal statement went over why I want to be a dentist, what went on it, but then, uh, and what qualities I can bring into like a dental school. Uh, and then for example, I think NYU asked, you know, why you would be a good fit at NYU. So it's kind of similar about your good qualities that you want to bring, but you have to direct it toward NYU school and like programs they're involved in. And it's very important that you put an equal amount of effort into those essays. It's, yeah, it's really important. Brenda, do you want to go next or should I go? We'll reverse the order, you can go now. Okay, cool. Um, I like definitely agree. I think um, Brandon and I were talking about this kind of briefly, but um, like at one point someone told me that like your application should be like a story and like it should tell like the story of you as a person. Um, I think that like supplemental essays are just another option and another like chance for you to basically tell that story. Um, also, someone told me at one point that like, if the school is asking you the supplemental question, they're reading it because if they're not reading it, then why would they even have the question in the first place? So um, like, it's there for a reason basically. And I agree with Austin. I think it's just like really important to make yourself sound or be unique in, in your supplemental essay because a lot of them are like, why this school? Um, and you don't really want to be saying the same exact things as everyone else. Like you don't wanna go onto that website and just find like their mission and just basically restate that. It's a really great way and another chance for you to like tell who you are and then explain why that fits the school like perfectly. Like why you are the best candidate possible for them. Um, and again, that's just like another, it's another space on your application um, for you to like vouch for yourself and be like, I am the one that you want. Um, so a supplemental essay to me was like great because it's just another way for me to like explain to them why I'm like a good candidate for them and like why I'm a good fit. So definitely use that space like to your advantage. Like, yeah, it's like more work, I guess, but um, like for schools that don't have supplementals, like you don't have an, like another chance to vouch for yourself. So. That's how I like kind of like looked at it. Yeah, that was great. Um, I, I guess to kind of add on to what you were mentioning also, um, a lot like it was mentioned that a lot of the schools ask you know, specifically why this program? Um, and they know that you wanna be a dentist and they know that you have manual dexterity and they know all these things. Um, and it's not enough to just say, you know, for example, this school has a mobile dental clinic and I'd love to get involved because that's just something on the front page of their dental school website and anyone could just write something related to that. What I kind of did is I took the approach of, you know, like in imagining myself in these scenarios, whether it be like give kids a smile day or, or a pediatric mobile dental unit or going abroad and doing dentistry, like what can I specifically contribute? Like what can I say here that is my, like my, my, they, they know like this is Brandon's application. Like this is something that they'll remember. Like I really, I've really thought about these things and it wasn't just listing things that they have on their website um, to kind of go off that a little bit more. Uh, the supplemental is a little different. The writing style is a little different, at least in my um, experience, a different from your personal statement. Your personal statement is, you know, you are telling a story from start to finish. You have to introduce yourself as an applicant and also tell them why dentistry and do a bunch of other things, uh, impress them in other ways in, in a lot of, uh, you have a lot of space to do it. And your supplemental, sometimes there's only 250 words or characters, whatever the case may be. Um, and so you do have to, I would recommend going straight to the point. 
um, and not being as verbose, for example, or using like, you know, you don't need necessarily need to be as creative, you know, minded when you're writing these supplementals. Um, and that's, that's another thing. And then um, in terms of having people proofread your supplementals, I also agree th these supplementals, if they wouldn't be there, if they weren't important and if they weren't something that they used to consider you as an applicant, I would really recommend having as many people read over your supplementals as possible. And I would not recommend having them all be someone who is in like a pre-dental friend that you have or a dentist or someone like that. Like I had my parents read these things. I had uh, like friends who are English majors, of course, read these things, but I asked people to read them with a different lens. So for example, if I asked an English major, I would say, you know, can you please read this for grammar and structure and things like that. Uh, and then I also just wanted their general feedback. Um, and so kind of getting that, that variety of readers and get as many different eyes on it as you can within reason, because everyone's going to have something different to say about all these supplementals. So you could go a little, drive yourself a little crazy in terms of writing drafts for these things. I think I had at least seven or eight personal statement drafts that were substantially different from one another until I finally landed on the thing that I thought was best. Um, so those are just some words of advice. Cool. Obviously it, uh, with each school comes a couple of supplementals. How did you guys go about deciding which schools you wanted to apply to and narrowing that down? So it wasn't like a huge list or if you had a huge list, how you went about getting all of that done. Okay. So when I applied, I mainly chose schools that I've heard of that are also near me. Um, you know, there, I mainly just chose schools for like distance wise and as well as for credibility and how like, like how interested I am in that program as well. Um, and then I also just out of my parents are moving to Florida and my brother already moved to Florida. So they want me to end up in Florida one way or another, or you have to come. So I applied to university of Florida as well. Um, just to let them be at ease. But, uh, besides that, all my schools were in New York, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, just like around right, just right here. Uh, and then I use Dental School Explorer a lot uh, to really compare each school, uh, you know, um, among each other to see tuition differences, um, you know, what specialties residencies they have, graduation rates, you know, all these like Dental School Explorer, I think, you know, like puts down a lot of like really important information and they really put all the schools side by side so you can compare it very easily. So that way I was able to bring down like a bunch of other schools that I wasn't as interested in. And I also didn't want to apply to too many schools because it is a lot of money to apply. So you really do want to be very specific with schools you want to go to. And if you have a focus of what you want to be in the future, that can help you narrow it down too. But for me, it was kind of tuition and then also distance that I chose my schools. Um, I had a really long list of schools that I applied to. <laughs> I applied to like, I would say five or six too many, um, like looking back on it. I think I like just personally was like nervous and I didn't really know what was gonna happen. So I just like thought to apply to like more, um, like just in case. Um, but like looking back on it, I think I kind of like regret that one piece. I think I just applied to like way too many. Um, and like distance wasn't really like too big of a problem for like, I just like wasn't really concerned about distance. Um, I do like undergrad in LA and I'm from New York. Um, so for me, if I'm like getting on a plane, I feel like I'm just getting on a plane. So distance wasn't really like an issue for me. I think it was more like if I could actually picture myself at the school, um, then like it was something that I would be interested in. Um, but again, like looking back on it, that's something that like I would have changed in my application process. Um, I think being like more specific in where I'm applying um, and I guess just like having more confidence in myself and like feeling like I don't need to apply to like 8 million schools, uh, but that is just me. Sorry, how yeah. many was that? Sorry, Brandon, I didn't mean to cut you off that you applied to. I applied to 17 schools and like it's, kind of crazy that I did 17 because it's just like it's a lot <laughs> yeah so you had mentioned maybe five or six too many so I applied to 12 um and so that's kind of this, that same um kind of whatever but uh I would say that definitely distance and the whole can you see yourself there but then two things that kind of came up 
uh, related to when I was applying. Uh, firstly, I thought I would apply to just a school um, because I liked it, but I didn't really think of the kind of how much the tuition is. And so it's one thing to just add it to your list and, and just think of it as, you know, it's no big deal. I'll just send out another application fee and it's not something I'll just think about this later. I really would recommend thinking about the finances like when you're actually adding the schools to the list, uh, because if not, you may be wasting some of your, your money by doing so. Um, because if you were, you know, go through the interview process and get in and then you see the, how much it costs per year, um, it could just be an automatic, you know, no off of your list. Um, and so that's just something to think about uh, kind of upfront. Um, but the next thing is, is um, like, so I applied to 12 schools. And so I would say like, I've heard of people kind of the minimum I've heard people apply to is like 10. Um, I'm sure people have applied to less. Um, but I would really just recommend like trusting yourself and your stats. And like, if you're on the money for like a lot of schools, like, then I would not go overboard. Like just if you are consistently in the range of a good group of schools, maybe like five, six, seven schools that you're applying to, like there's no reason to like send an application to somewhere in the Midwest if you were never gonna consider going there to begin with um, just because they have a quote unquote good program. Um, so, so really think about that, like trust yourself as an applicant. Um, it's one, if you have, you know, all the things that, if you know, you know, that your application is like looking good, for example, like, and you can, do well in an interview, like just trust that that's going to happen. Like this, you're here for a reason. You got through all your pre-dental requirements. Like I really just like trust the process is something that I would really uh, recommend. And that kind of applies to choosing how many schools you want to apply to. Another quick thing I just want to add on to was to help narrow down searches, especially when you're applying for schools that are far away. Uh, you look at how out of state friendly they are. Um, even on Dental School Explorer, they mentioned the specific rates uh, like Yukon isn't as far from me. I'm in New York right now uh, or between New York and New Jersey. Um, so when I applied in Yukon, you know, it, I was very interested in the program, but I knew that they're out of state. They were, weren't very out of state friendly. More than 90% of the students they have, according to even during the uh, interview cycle and during like the Q and A's for Yukon, they mentioned that over 90% are in-state students for Yukon and they only take like, you know, 10% max of out of state friendly people. So if, UConn's not a school that you want to go to and you see rates like that, that could help you narrow down your search. So that's something I want to just add as well. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so then our next set of questions is about interviews. Um, so firstly, how did you all prepare for interviews? And then when did you guys start hearing back from them? Sorry, sorry, I just had to plug my laptop in. Um, so, I started hearing back from, as I applied maybe first week of, or second week of June. Uh, and I heard back from UConn. UConn was my first school, I think in August or end of July, beginning of August. Uh, it was very early because the other ones came in kind of a little bit later, like end of July and then Rutgers and other ones came in middle of August around there. So uh, I, to be honest, only started interviewing um, as I got interviews, you know, it's definitely something that you should prepare for uh, in advance because I got my interview for UConn, but I only started like when it started nearing the, uh, the date for the interview. So I was really stressed uh, and it was a lot of work. Like really looking at it, there's a lot of questions that they can ask you and you really want to be spot on. But uh, it's not just knowing your answers. It's really like speaking like as if you're not reading from something, you really need to speak from the heart when you're on there. You don't want to sound like robotic when you're speaking or monotone. It's really about how you word and a lot of like public speaking skills involved too. So it was a lot of work to take it in a little time. So I would suggest that, you know, just start as soon as you can, like um, a month, I think is a really good amount of time for me. I, I only, I started like maybe two weeks before and that put me too much stress. But after my first interview, um, which happened to be Rutgers because I changed UConn because they actually gave me the same date. Um, I was a little bit more comfortable with how the, the interview cycle went and I was able to answer questions well. And you'll see that a lot of these questions are very conversational. Some are not, some are trying to like really see who you are as a person. But I would say majority of my interviews, maybe 95% were very conversational. So it was something that I was very relieved upon. And, um, it's really about practice. You really need to know the main questions about dentistry, like why dentistry? Why do you want to like go to this school? Tell me about yourself, strengths, weaknesses. There are some common questions that you'll see almost on every single interview. So as long as you have those, 
that's such a great start to your interview and everything else can lead into conversation. So it's really how you speak and talk to them as well. So it's very important. Yeah, I, I loved interviewing. <laughs> like it was like really nerve wracking right beforehand, obviously. Um, it's like panic. But once you're like there, I mean, we weren't actually like physically there, but like when we were virtually there, um, it happens like so naturally just because they like really know who you are from your application. Like if if they've asked you to an interview, um, they really do knew, like know who you are and they, they like want you there. Um, and someone at one point told me that like the interview was like meant to just like seal the deal and just like kind of confirm that like you like are meant to be at their program. Um, I, I think I got my first invitation maybe like the end of August. And I think I started like the second week of September um, and was interviewing until maybe the first or second week of November. Um, and with like everything being virtual, I had like one week where I had like three interviews like back to back. Um, and I guess like kind of like what Austin was saying, like you'll do like your first one or, or maybe two, um, it's like nerve wracking, but then you like have it down to a science. Like, you know, your story so well that you can like say it to anyone, <laughs> like anyone can ask you like what, like why you want to be a dentist. And like, I can just like recite to you everything that I told them because I did it so many times. Like you just practice and practice and practice. Um, I would recommend using Student Doctor Network um, to like prep for these interviews because they have like a whole page dedicated to like interview prep um, where like past students will um, throw in like questions that they were asked during those interviews at that specific school. Um, so I would definitely use that. It also kind of explains what the style of the interview is. Um, that was like a point of um, stress for me because um, I had never really done an interview other than like a traditional like conversational interview and not all interviews are like that so um, I would definitely just like check to see what kind of interview you're going into um, and then specifically prep for that style um, like leading up to it just like for example some schools are MMI which means multiple mini interviews so they like ask you like multiple different questions that might not even relate to you at all. Just like random questions about life or dental like practicing or like literally anything. Um, so definitely just like do your research um, before you go in. Um, but other than that, like I think, I think interviewing is really just like fun. <laughs> they like just wanna know who you are as a person. They just wanna see that like you can do basically anything that you said that you did that in your application um, and just show them like you like are meant to be a dentist and you're meant to be a dentist like from their school. Yeah, so many great things were just mentioned and I agree with all of them. Um, and so I guess my, my answer to this question, well, firstly, I think my first interview, I heard back mid-August from Rutgers, which is actually where I met Austin at our in-person interview, um, which was kind of funny. Um, but then in terms of what I did to prepare for interviews, so. The biggest thing I would say is be prepared to answer four major questions. The first one is why dentistry? Make sure that this answer is not exactly just you restating your personal statement. Uh, this is a chance for you to maybe tell a little story and then get to the point. And I was very clear and explicit in answering my question and, and answering this question. I would, I literally said, I want to be a dentist because, and then I would list the reasons. And then I went into small amount of detail for each of those points. And I kind of had like, a bullet list memorized in my head. I tried to rehearse it to the point where, like not rehearsing it to where it sounded like I memorized it, but to the point where I didn't have to like think about these bullet points in my head. And obviously this is an answer from the heart. So it didn't really, it wasn't too difficult to, to give that answer. And like Michelle had mentioned, it's something that it, it becomes fun and you can answer these questions to anyone. So that's the first one. Keep this to around two minutes. The next one is why not medicine? Uh, I was asked this twice. And so um, if you're in a situation where you're applying to a school, like you know, you could have just as easy, a lot of, everyone could have just as easily taken the MCAT, for example, and applied to medical school. So sometimes they might ask you, you know, why dentistry and why not medicine, for example. And so I gave my answer to that. And then the, uh, the next one would be, tell me about yourself. 
This one, you can like 99% of the time know that this is coming out right out of the gates. So they're going to sit down with you at the interview and they're going to say, tell me about yourself. And so this is a chance to kind of tell, tell them where you're from, tell them kind of what type of family you had, and then go into where you went to undergrad and then some things you did for fun. Um, and so make sure you really give a full picture of yourself. And again, like no more than two minutes for these sorts of questions. Um, in terms of sourcing where, like a, kind of like the best resource online, Student Doctor Network is really great. A lot of people will post um, what they were asked during their interviews. And you can't guarantee that that's gonna be the exact same that the thing that they ask you at these schools, but it's a good um, kind of framework to follow. Um, the next thing that I did is I would always make sure I prepared questions for my interviewer uh, at the end because they'll always say, oh, do you have any questions for me? And it's not necessarily the best look to say no and then just like, all right, see you later. So you definitely want to um, do your research for, uh, on the school and make sure you're again asking like really personalized questions, like how can you get involved in X, Y, Z? I wouldn't recommend asking how you can get involved in research. That's just like, like kind of a really basic question and it's not something that they'll, that'll stick with the interviewer. So that's just something to keep in mind. And the next thing is like, just the, the last thing here is like kind of you are in the driver's seat. Like they ask you a question, you can say whatever you want. This is your, you have the floor. So you really could drive the conversation in ways that it wouldn't really, you wouldn't expect. So you can say, answer their question. If it's something you don't feel that comfortable with answering, you can then just like keep talking and then talk about a strength that you have that's related and then just talk about, oh, I, I you know, this relates to this activity that I did. And here's your chance to talk about something that maybe you only have 12 hours logged on your application, but if this is, you can highlight it and then talk about it. I had an interview where it was so conversational that I didn't even realize we started. And then at the end, he's like, oh, not, let me just ask you some of these like interview questions that I have to ask you. And then he's like, tell me about yourself. He's like, well, we already did that. And then the next one was like, tell me about a challenge. And so just have that question prepared. It's probably something you'll answer a few times in your supplementals. But again, these are very conversational, way more than you would really expect. Um, yeah. I think you mentioned like a really good thing, just like something that I like was not very good at and needed to work on um, is like, like actually mentioning something specific in your application. Like don't ask, like wait for them to ask you about it. Like it is, it is your time to like take the initiative and say like, oh yes, like I did this. And like, like, this is why I am this. Like, like they're not going to ask you specifically about things on your application. And so like, it is, it is your responsibility, I guess, <laughs> to kind of like say it yourself, which like I was not very good at like initially. And it was something that I really needed to work on, like bringing up like things that like like you kind of have to like boast yourself. You kind of have to say like, oh, like I did this. Like, and like, yeah, like I'm like really good at this um, because like they're not going to like kind of like prompt it unless I guess it's like an open interview, but that's like very specific and niche. So like, otherwise I would say like kind of like practice, like, like bringing up specific things in your application or like past experiences that like prove um, like something that they might ask you. Uh, one more thing I also want to bring up is a question that I was asked specifically this year that I think they'll definitely ask every single one of you guys applying next year is COVID and how COVID has affected you. Um, I'm going to say I'm pretty sure every single interview you asked me that question. Uh, it was very important, even though, you know, COVID just started right at the beginning of our application cycle. Uh, but I think since people that are applying this year, you guys had that whole year and the rest of the 2021, you know, all affected by COVID and that affected a lot of things. So it's your time to really emphasize how COVID even helped you, how it, you know, brought you down, how you were able to overcome it, how, you know, just any way it affected you because they really want to know like, you know, how it did. Now, for me personally, what I brought up was that um, even during COVID, you know, dental offices weren't considered essential until a couple months later. So we were closed for a little bit. But as soon as we came back, you know, we had such new protocol and such new PPE that we had to wear. And that was something that I mentioned during my interviews for every single one, like COVID affected me because, you know, we were able to transition online for school. It was difficult, but also I was able to learn a lot of new, like, you know, exposure patterns and a lot of different like protocols that dental offices are the newest protocols that all dental offices must take right now, basically. So that was a big thing, but they're most likely going to ask you about COVID. So I would definitely keep that on the top of those important questions. Um, our year is very different or your year is going to be very different than every other year we had in the past. So definitely keep that in mind.
Cool, cool. Well, I think um, that's most of what we had. We covered personal statements, supplementals, um, amount of schools, interview process. So overall, it was great. If anybody else has any questions, um, feel free to speak up or I'm sure the panelists are happy to stay a couple minutes after to answer those as well. But if not, thank you guys so much. Um, it was a great event. Thanks, Axe, for setting all of it up. Um, great to have everyone. Yeah, I'm good to stick around as well. So if anyone uh, has any other questions, either uh, you could enter them to the chat or you could unmute yourself. All right, so Sherry had asked, um, how would you recommend students prepare for the DAT? So Michelle, would you like to start that one? Sure, um, that was kind of a long time ago for me, but um, I use DAT Bootcamp. I also use the, the Destroyer book, but only for math um, because the math section was like something that I was kind of concerned about. So I only got the book for math. Um, DAT Bootcamp does a really good job of like giving you a schedule, which I really liked. Um, I think that was like, I guess the best part about it for me, um, just cause it broke down like everything that you should cover um, within like certain days. So you're not like super overwhelmed um, to kind of like do everything. They're like, okay, you can do like X and X on this day. Um, and they also just have like a million practice questions um, that are available to you that are pretty similar um, to the actual DAT. But I think like my biggest like word of advice is just like, don't like become so overwhelmed in the beginning because like there's just so much information. Um, like you're not gonna know everything perfectly. And that's kind of just like the reality of the test because there's just so much information. Um, I would say just like make sure to cover everything. Um, and if there's any like point of like content, like there's, there's anything on the test that you don't feel super comfortable with, I think the destroyer is a really good supplement. And if there's anything else, because that was kind of a long time ago for me, so. Yeah, so I use DAT Bootcamp as well. Um, and I use the destroyer books for biology and for math. Um, one thing about uh, the math section, um, I kind of underestimated it. Um, you look at kind of some review and a topical review when you're first starting and you're like, oh, this is something that I can postpone until like when I'm closer to the exam. I definitely would not recommend doing that. Math should be, I think something that's done uh, kind of concurrently with PAT is just like a supplemental whenever you have like a free minute, just like do some math questions or something like that. Um, because it can kind of sneak up on you and then you maybe you're like two weeks out and then you're like, oh, this score I'm getting on this practice exam is not where I really want it to be. Um, because the math, um, it's, it's like the PAT where you get good at it, you'll learn certain strategies. Um, it's unlike bio or gen chem or orgo or the other sections where you can't really, like there's no limit to, to the, those sciences, but in terms of the math and the PAT, like you really can get yourself to a, um, a level where you feel very comfortable and it's also like almost like a systematic um, kind of approach where you know what's kind of coming. Uh, I'll speak to the first section of the exam, which shows, so that's biology, gen chem, and then organic chemistry in that order for the natural sciences section. And I'm a biology and society major at school, but the majority of my courses are biology. Um, that was actually my worst section on my actual DAT. And I think a lot of it has to do with two things. Firstly, uh, the, just the breadth of information is, is absolutely insane. They asked me about the lungs of a spider on my DAT. And I looked at that question and I was like, okay, this is gonna be a guess. So I just, I just didn't waste time on that question, but I was like actually shocked. And I think I laughed to myself like, there's no way I know this answer. Um, but then uh, a lot of it also was nerves. So that biology is the first uh, thing that you start off with. So when you're in that natural sciences section, you can actually skip and go to different, you know, there's a, I guess, maybe like 150 questions in that section. And someone could correct me if I don't remember exactly. Um, but you can start with gen chem, for example, and then go back to biology. Um, and so in looking back, I probably would have done that because I actually was more comfortable with the chemistry for some reason, even though I'm like kind of a biology major, but that was just my own personal approach. And then um, that's pretty much it. Reading, uh, just do a lot of practice um, and yeah. Um, yeah, so I only used DAT Bootcamp. I actually didn't use Destroyer. Uh, it definitely would help, but I just 
I love the DAT bootcamp uh, program and how easy and convenient it's set for you. You know, they give you that, I think it was Aries study guide, that 60 something days worth of thing. I went through that like, like clockwork. I was going every day by the same thing. I was in school at the same time too. So the days I had other work as well, I would consistently follow that whole day's worth as long with it. But days that I was off or weekends, I would really, you know, it is a lot of work, but once you get the hang of it, like you'll get, you'll really get through them and you'll understand them a lot better. They're able to combine days. So I would have like day 33 and day 34 together, or, you know, like here and there, like save time with it too. And I would say a big thing is also, start studying and make sure you know when to start studying and like when you're when you plan to take the DAT it's important that you kind of like flow right into your DAT date you don't want to study have a break of just like oh let me figure out I guess I'll keep studying for a little bit and then go like for me it was very important that like I followed the schedule had a week of just more practice and then I went straight into it and that's exactly how I did it so I followed the schedule I had a week of just extra practice that I wanted on my own to review things that I didn't and I took the test so uh, but DAT bootcamp to me was probably the most convenient and easiest way for me to learn. Uh, they had videos, they had, uh, you know, live tutors and people that are responding on the top. Um, and another thing is like, if you run out of your trial, they're very nice. You can always email them and be like, listen, like I'm taking my DAT in like two weeks, but I just, I rescheduled it. I need a little bit more time. They'll give you a free 30 days. Like they do it to almost every single person. You know, there are a lot of coupon codes you can get to get like 50 to hundred dollars off too at the beginning. So it's very convenient. They have booster packs. And then one thing that was pretty difficult was the practice test they have on DAT Bootcamp. It's pretty difficult and it gets difficult as you get to the last practice test. But one thing that was reassuring was that the DAT was a lot easier than these practice tests, like any of the practice tests. Like for me, like there was, well, the first practice tests were kind of easy, but the later on you keep going on and on, it gets very, very difficult. Um, and it's, you know, it's overwhelming, but it, just to reassure you guys, like it's not gonna be as hard. Uh, uh, as long as you guys studied really well, like I, you guys, you should be a little bit more confident with it. Like it's very important. Um, another thing with me is that I get very overwhelmed and stressed easily. Um, and like, I'm like claustrophobic too. So when you take your DAT, it's important that you have ways to like, you know, kind of like relax yourself and breathe. Like for me, it was breathing. Like you're in a kind of a confined area with like a camera on you and stuff. Like they're like watching you to make sure you're not cheating basically. But it's very important. Like it's the little things, but like it's very important that you also know like to keep your calm. Like when you read the questions, you, you'll know most of them and it'll give you the confidence you need. So I said, it's very important that you follow that, follow that way. There's another question in the chat. Um... What do you guys think about submitting the application before taking the DAT, considering that I have a GPA a little lower than the average? How can they, would they put me in a different pool? Um, do either of you know like how that would work? Okay, so uh, I don't know personally, but I read a lot of student network and spoke to a lot of people that went through this. Um, so when it comes to submitting your app earlier, uh, before you take your DAT, you still submit it, but it won't be reviewed until your DAT scores are actually sent to the school. I'm not exactly sure if it's going to be a completely different pool, but I know that it's not reviewed and like ready to be like, you know, setting out an interview until your DAT scores are a part of it. So I'm, it could be a different pool when it comes to that. Um, I don't know if your GPA will affect having that different pool. That GPA will be considered when your DAT scores are in as well, and they'll look at it holistically altogether. I know that you're able to submit it, but I know it's not going to be reviewed until your DAT scores are in. That's at most what I really know, so I'm not going to keep going on it. I'm not too sure, but from what people have done and what people have said on like different websites and stuff, they're not going to review it until your DAT score, scores are in, but they will be able to, I guess, access your application, but I know it's not really reviewed you know, until the scores are all in because they want to review it all together because things affect each other a lot. So you really need to have the scores in. I, I almost did that, but um, because of COVID, you know, my two, my test was June, I think, 8th. And because of COVID, they extended June 1st to June 14th as the first day. So I was able to actually take it and then, oh, okay, I'm good, submit it. So, but, um, you know, it, it I would say like, if it's not too late, you can, I would say it always helps taking the DAT and then submitting in case you get a score that you're not comfortable with submitting. Uh, I had a lot of people that were thankful that they didn't submit because they want to retake it and take another year and now they're in this year. So it's very like important, but 
you know, it all depends on how you feel, how you're comfortable with it. Definitely ask more people about it in their opinions. So.